All right, so our topic for today is uh, obstetrics uh, infections. Um, the, the, quest, the, the slide you're seeing has nothing to do with it. I just wanted to make sure that our poll, our poll is, uh, is working. So for uh, it's a relatively short discussion. Um, and like I said, if anybody has uh, questions, please unmute your microphone and speak up because I won't be able to see your uh, raised hands or the chat while I'm uh, in a presenter view. So um, topics, so going from uh, just prior to delivery, intrapartum to postpartum, uh, refractory fever, postpartum, um, infections with perineal lacerations, uh, post-abortal infections, and a little bit of um, uh, stragglers like UTI, group B strep, and HSV. Okay, so let's start. So the first is prior to giving delivery, uh, intrapartum or just prior to giving the del del uh, delivering the baby, intraamniotic infection syndrome, uh, fancy name, or also known as uh, chorioamnionitis, right? So it's this is clinically. So you'll see, you guys will see a pattern here where in uh, it, when we're looking for infections in obstetrics, it's mostly a clinical diagnosis, right? Because we can't really do any invasive testing. Um, and, and basically women uh, uh, about to deliver and uh, presenting with fevers. So uh, chorioamnionitis is clinically detectable infection of the amniotic fluid itself and the fetal membranes. And it is associated with dysfunctional labor. And the pathogenesis is, again, kind of going through that similar pattern, an ascending infection of vaginal microbes following the uh, member, uh, membrane rupture. So here comes our first question for the day. Which organisms result from a transplacental hematogenous spread in mothers with bacteremia? I want to see at least uh, nine results. It's going up. OK, excellent. Keep going. And like I said, you can either use the uh, web, uh, use a web browser, or you can text as well. Text, text is easy too. If you text uh, Juhi Katzman four four zero to that number on top two two three three three, and then you can start answering once it gives you a go. All right, we have ten results uh, so far. So which one is it? Ah learning opportunity <laughs> okay so oh yes you can still change your answer yes <laughs> so the correct answer is is it pulling up the correct answer is listeria monocytogenous and again right so, so a lot of Women are, you know, there are a lot of food restrictions uh, for for pregnant ladies, and this is one of the reason why that we uh, advise the, you know, um, um, pregnant ladies not to eat, you know, un uncooked meats and cheese, because this is this is a very um, high morbidity uh, morbidity infection, and it leads to uh, bacteremia, and then therefore. Uh, hematogenous spread in the mother and and transplantal ap afterwards not your usual ascending infection from all these other uh, bacteria that you see listed okay e coli you could um potentially but it's mostly if we're, when we're talking about uh chorioamnionitis it's more 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 of an ascending infection than bacteria uh, bacteremia unless the patient is really septic or let's say has like pyelonephritis So thinking about so let's say right when we're when we're uh, when we are consulted uh, at TGH really not, not, no no pregnant ladies at the VA or or Moffitt when we're consulted at, at, at TGH and and for for a fever in somebody who's in uh, uh, undergoing labor for the most part I think we we get consulted after the baby's delivered. Um, but when when this happens yes what would you what would be what would 
what we would be looking for and like ask the patients, right? So, so some of, so thinking about the pathogenesis, right? So it's, it's an ascending infection. So what would predispose these ladies um, for corium amnionitis? I just want to hear everybody's thoughts uh, and see. Yes, premature, uh, prolonged labor. What else? And right, because these would be the questions we would be asking the patients, like what happened, or also looking through the chart um, for, for these risk factors. Anything else? Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, so some of the risk factors. So, so yes, correct, right? So anything that kind of disrupts that um, or, or yes, thank you, or anything that kind of disrupts that flora or or um, basically pushing some of these microbes more upwards uh, and all of those are correct. So uh, prolonged duration of labor or ROMs, rupture of membranes. Thank you everybody for, for who, who answered. Multiple vaginal exams, right? Just prior to going to delivery, they um, the pregnant ladies get vaginal exams to see how much they're dilated. And some of these other factors were associated to young age, nulliparity, pre-existing BV, uh, bacterial vaginosis. Although uh, having uh, bacterial vaginosis in pregnancies, uh, they they're debating if whether we should treat all of them or or because because of this reason or or you know for those who are more stable and not treat uh, diagnostic amniocentesis, intrauterine transfusions. Uh, percutaneous umbilical sampling and cerclage. What is a cerclage? Does anybody know? What's a cervical cerclage? Do you remember from your OB days? Anybody? Just want to hear somebody's voice. <laughs> it's Michelle. We have I have a few students with me. We were talking about it. It kind of prevents the baby from coming out if the cervix is not functioning properly. Thank you. Yes. Very, very, very well explained. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, it's basically your suture. You're putting a circumferential suture around the cervix to pre prevent preterm delivery in, in somebody with cervical insufficiency. Thank you, Michelle. All right, epidemiology. So I was actually a little bit surprised that it was not, not double negative, not uncommon. So it happens in about 10% of women in labor. Um, more so in preterm labor, uh, oh, well, le less so in preterm labor with intact membranes, right? Remember, the rupture of membrane is is is, there, is a risk factor, and and about 20% of pre preterm labor has about uh, has a subclinical infection as well. 75% um, of ladies that who are affected in their full term labor would need an augmentation of labor. And 35% of ladies actually end up with a cesarean section because of arrest of labor. So um, very, uh, it again leads to a dysfunctional labor because of the infection. So the microbes that we think about, um, by the way, so these are so these are the ones that are uh, implicated in chorionitis. But generally, right, there is a normal flora that's present in the in 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 the vagina, which is mostly lac your lactobacilli, the good good lactobacilli, and the diphtheroids. And in patients who who eventually develop chorionitis, they they say they're um, that they're already colonized with more higher virulent microbes, such as these uh, that's that are listed. So E. coli, Group B strep mycoplasma and more pathogenic anaerobes. And again, so, uh, some of these may be related to bacterial vaginosis. So how do you diagnose? So we will, we will, so as infectious disease consultants, we will always get called for fevers, but for the most part, again, this is um, very well um, managed by our OB colleagues. So um, you'll see later where where we where our potential our expertise more come in <laughs> where we get usually consulted so so um, pregnant ladies and uh, undergoing labor with a fever plus at least two of these ca uh, categories where you have maternal or fetal uh, tachycardia leukocytosis more than 15,000 uterine tenderness and foul smelling amniotic fluid um, and, and in somebody who's already had, let's say, a uh, rupture of membrane prior to coming into the hospital, 
or there is some diagnostic criteria where you can test the amniotic fluid itself, you can gram stain it and look for um, uh, white blood cell and glucose. But if you look at the diagnosis, it's very vague because sure, the fever fever is, is pretty straightforward, but maternal and or fecal tachycardia, right? So if you if you if somebody's having already a fever, then you can have uh, concomitant tachycardia. So that doesn't really help you. For leukocytosis, remember also in, in some of the these preterm labors, um, especially less than 32 weeks age of gestation, patients get placed on steroids as well for fetal lung development. So that may interfere with that leukocytosis criteria. Uterine tenderness, you may not always appreciate it because, right, somebody's already in labor or they're, they've un already undergone anesthesia, so that's that's not very helpful too. And they say foul smell and amniotic fluids very rarely appreciated. So it's really somebody with fever. <laughs> um, and again, uh, some of these uh, patients that, that's been seen at TGH, any of the other attendings, if you want to chime in, please uh, please feel free to do so. Treatment, again, like we don't usually get a uh, call for these uh, patients, but if so, you would see a lot of amp and gent being used in our uh, in our OB world. So, um, so antibiotics should be considered in delivering mamas with fever, uh, and that's mainly to prevent any bacteremia in the mother and again, transplacental infection that would go down to the, uh, to the infant. And there is definitely an improved outcome uh, in intrapartum uh, versus po uh, postpartum when, when, when these mamas get, uh, get antibiotics. So the treatment itself is the delivery of the fetus and the placenta, right? Because we're sort of just removing that focus of infection, removing that um, potentially like an abscess developing or, or that fo focus of infection. Um, if this doesn't happen, if, if these ladies don't get treated uh, empirically for the for the fevers and uh, uh, chorioamnionitis, there's a 50% uh, risk of developing post postpartum endometri endometritis. So to, in order to prevent that, it's best to just go ahead and give them the antibiotics. So usually the combination that's used in the OB world is ampicillin for to targeting group B strep and gentamicin for your E. coli. Um, let me see here. For vaginal deliveries, they say you can give one dose intrapartum and then just another dose just postpartum. For C-section, you may want to kind of continue it a little bit longer until they're febrile and also consider uh, adding anaerobic coverage if their fever doesn't come down um, uh, quickly. And this is not, so this is like the basic regimen and all the other regimens, you know, with your second second generation cephalosporins or your extended uh, beta lactam penicillins are just equally effective. This is just to use your most kind of narrow spectrum antibiotics. All right, for our next question. Chorioamnionitis is an indication for emergent cesarean delivery. True or false? Uh, too bad this slide doesn't really show us um, actually the the how many how many folks are answering. Okay, there's some movement there. Thank you. The answer is actually false. It's it's not an it's not an indication for emergency uh, cesarean delivery. But yes, thank you everybody for answering. All right, so the baby's been delivered, and the the uh, pregnant lady, well, postpartum lady, is having fever. And this is, I want to say, after delivery is where we get called the most, but also at the same time, a few days probably after, you know, because the OB, our OB colleagues would have already started the antibiotics, and then they're still fevering. So later down, then they call us. So postpartum endometritis, right? It's again, it's always the focus is on the uterus. Um, postpartum infection of the uterus. It is the most common cause of peripheral fever. So the risk factor again is kind of spreading that that uh, focus of infection, which would be your amniotic fluid or you know any of your vaginal flora, 
Uh, so the risk factor is cesarean delivery when we when the OB colleagues, you know, uh, make that incision. Some of that fluid, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse um, mouse pointer, but can can kind of travel outside the uh, the uterus and go to the abdominal cavity and also retroperitoneum and to the to uh, other parts of your uh, uterus. So it's a direct inoculation during uh, during cesarean delivery. Um, if the the occurrence is less than 10% if patients get um, antibiotic prophylaxis and therefore for all cesarean delivery, patients would get um, an antibiotic prophylaxis. Looking at microbiology, so it's mostly polymicrobial, kind of similar to also some of your organisms that we read uh, on the left-hand side from the chorioamnionitis picture, right? Your group B, again, same, same bugs, group B strep, uh, aerobic strep, Gardnerella, bacterial vaginosis, E. coli, and some of these, and never, never forget about your anaerobes. On the right-hand side, um, some of these bugs have been implicated as well. Your ureoplasma, ureolyticum, and mycoplasma hominis, especially, they've been implicated in um, abdominal wound infection after cesarean sections. Chlamydia, uh, don't forget about uh, STDs in these ladies as well, because cl chlamydia, though, also have been in implicated for more late onset disease, like, let's say um, after a few days or even up to six weeks after uh, vaginal delivery. And group A strep is interesting because um, this has been um, implicated in outbreaks in hospitals and, and mostly associated with colonization in the healthcare workers and not necessarily the uh, pregnant ladies. So how to be diagnosed postpartum endometritis? Again, same thing, fever. <laughs> fever and some sort of uterine discomfort, discomfort abdominal pain, uh, leukocytosis, and also delay of normal, normally rapid post-up return bowel, of, bowel function. Why do you guys think that is? Why, why would there be a delay of bowel function when there's postpartum endometritis? What are we looking for? Anybody? Think about the pathophysiology, what happens when, the, when, when you leak all those amniotic fluid that's potentially infected. Anybody? <laughs> Does it become like a peritonitis because it went into the yes. abdominal cavity? Thank you, Michelle. Local peritonitis is the word I was looking for. Thank you. And for, uh, again, late onset fevers, post, uh, postpartum endometritis, don't forget about chlamydia, okay? Thank you. Okay, management, um, potentially a little bit more aggressive, um, but the, the our um, OB colleagues' uh, drug of choice is clindamycin plus gentamicin. And after that, our, our usual kind of, you know, your ex extended spectrum penicillins or your second generation cephalosporins, um, as you can see here listed. So failure with these antibiotic regimen is, is, is uncommon unless you have a uh, documented or you were able to culture out a very res uh, drug resistant anaerobe, in which case we may need to consider if, if your initial regimen doesn't have a good anaerobic regimen, then you may want to consider adding uh, clindamycin or metronidazole to cover some of these anaerobes. Okay, further management. So what happens if they have persistent fever? So and again, that's this is where we where we come in. And so other other um, uh, infections or deeper uh, infections that we need to think about is either let's say you know definitely look at their uh, uh, C-section wound, or maybe they're they're developing an abscess. And there is an entity called uh, refractory postpartum fever, which we would talk about. And also think about right non-infectious fevers, right? This is this is really our this is where we shine as infectious disease doctors. And we're not only we're looking for infections, but other reasons why uh, these ladies would have fever, such as drug fever, bre uh, breast engorgement, and hematomas. Um, in which case, you would need more further diagnostic imaging. Uh, and also remember, some, the the late the 
ladies who give birth, not all of, not everybody um, has, are able to breastfeed immediately. So breast engorgement is actually one of those more prominent ones that happen a few days after delivery. Um, screening healthcare workers, if we have, this is more infection control, infection prevention um, issue. If there are more than two episodes of postpartum group A strep identified within six months, within a six month period, uh, this should uh, trigger alarm and, and, and say, and they say we need to screen those, uh, those healthcare workers who have been in contact with the patients, we culture their nares, throat, vagina, rectum, seems invasive <laughs> skin for group A strep. And these healthcare workers should be refrained from patient care in the first 24 hours of, of being treated for their group A strep. Any questions so far? We're like halfway through the lecture. Nope. Okay, uh, so refractory fever. So we're basically kind of, you've already started the antibiotics in these patients who had fever for post, uh, postpartum endometritis, but they still keep having fever. So this is, this is, where, this is where we come in, AKA ID consult. Um, so th uh, and disease entities to think about, right? Again, aside from our usual, like we said, the, the abscess, the um, breast engorgement, um, septic pelvic thrombophlebitis, right, is, is something to think about. And you can really diagnose this uh, via um, deeper imaging, let's say a CAT scan. And they say actually, and, and, you know, we also get asked about, hey, should we treat this patient with heparin or no heparin? And they found that actually there's no difference in responses, whether you give them heparin versus no heparin while continuing on your antibiotics. Um, and in these patients who are diagnosed with septic pelvic uh, thrombophlebitis, and the, for the average, they get about five to six days of antibiotics until they uh, defer best. And sometimes it just takes time. They say <laughs> time takes time to resolve the fever. And we can consider, especially if the patient has already kind of completed, you know, this uh, almost about a week of antibiotic therapy, if they're looking well, they have a normal pelvic exam, uh, no leukocytosis, um, they're ready to go home, they're begging you to go home, maybe also consider just sending it home uh, without antibiotics. Infections after perineal lacerations is, is divided um, into four categories. Um, it is pretty rare. Um, 0.1% of all episiotomies worse with deeper, um, obviously deeper uh, injuries and lacerations and, and routine episiotomy is no longer recommended. Um, and, 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 and it has to be a very specific criterion or, or judge, uh, judgment by your um, uh, obstetrician to, to undergo uh, a, an episiotomy. Um, so there is a lower rate of wound complication with antibiotic prophylaxis at the time of repair with your second generation of uh, cephalosporin. But like I said, it's, it's not routinely done, so it's, it's probably more of um, uh, OB uh, expertise, obviously. So <clears throat> like I said, the uh, infection depends on the depth of your laceration. And it's uh, basically going down your, from the mucosa down deep to the muscle. So you have, we have simple infections, which is just a local infection. Then you go down to the superficial fa uh, fascia and then the deep fascia and then down to the muscle leading to myonecrosis. So for the, uh, for the first two, your simple and uh, superficial uh, fascia involvement, these are limited to the skin. Um, and, and, and also maybe a little bit of your superficial fascia lung incision. Uh, both of them are medically managed. You're tr we're targeting again your uh, vaginal um, flora, your strep, some staph, some anaerobes, and your bacteria. And if the ther and, and you'll see again, you will see always this pattern, right? If the therapeutic response is not prompt, they're, they keep having fevers or they keep having um, local discomfort, we got uh, the surgeons are got need to go in and explore the wound and the bride as needed. Kind of similar thing as your superficial fascia infection. 
you'll see there's a, a, a lot of very erythematous and edematous skin on, on vaginal exam with the absence of severe systemic manifestations. Again, medically managed, with no improvement, explore the wound and surgery. So this is, and after this is where it gets more uh, serious when the infection is deep enough that it's a, it has already kind of necrosed your superficial fascia and, and it's it's going down to your deep fascia, aka necrotizing fasciitis. So in these patients, this if we do a vaginal exam, you would actually not see um, any signs of um, of infections because the wound is really deep. But if you if you start palpating, there will be a lot of pain, um, more uh, kind of almost out of proportion, and in a very ill appearing patient with high fever, systemic manifestations, hypotensions, and majority of these patients are diabetic. So so um, uh, be very careful when you're examining uh, patients with diabetes with this uh, very uh, in, and and they're very ill appearing because their their infection might be very very deep. Um, and the definitive diagnosis is made in surgery, of course, they, they need to be in the operating table with prompt, prompt uh, start of very broad spectrum antibiotics. Again, your usual regimen that you see, clindamycin, ampicillin, gentamicin, plus very radical and aggressive debridement. Again, this is sort of, again, the, the kind of treatment of choice in the obstetric swirls, but if you use any other extended spectrum of penicillin is they just work just fine. And the worst and worst of them all, myonecrosis, if it, when the infection is so deep that it's down to the muscles, it is a medical medical emergency. Uh, medical emergency, think of uh, your Clostridium species, Clostridium perfringens leading to gas gangrene, very, very ill looking patients. Um, and uh, let's say with the repairs of their episiotomy, sometimes they do these right uh, local anesthesia to paracervical or pudendal needles, and that may even um, that might be a risk risk factor for developing uh, this myonecrosis. And patients would have like either hip pains or um, pains when they're when they're flexing their thighs or or at their hip joint. Again. Uh, management would be surgery on the OR table and uh, antibiotic. And the treatment of choice, if you were able to, let's say, isolate uh, cl uh, Clostridium perfringens eventually is high-dose penicillin with, um, with clindamycin to turn off the toxin production, right? All right, I think this is second, uh, second to the last question. Oops. Okay. So this is more like a trivia question. This organism has been associated with severe toxic shock syndrome, myonecrosis from episiotomy, sorry for a typo, retention of vaginal packs, degeneration of cervical myoma, and postpartum endometritis. So a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, risk factors there associated with this particular um, bug. Uh, patients are very sick usually. Um, they have severe unrelenting hypotension, third spacing, um, and also potentially in the absence of ra a rash or a fever, and it is rapidly fatal disease. I have to figure out a way how to add some music to this <laughs> while we we're waiting for, for the results to come in. <laughs> okay, so we have Staph aureus, your Pseudomonas, two Clostridium species, and, and a strep. What do, you, what do you guys think this is? And I can't remember if this was in, in the actual board exam, but definitely during our uh, board review series, this came up. All right, I am happy with 10 results. All right, learning opportunity, yes. <laughs> so if you notice, you know, these patients, again, right, the, the clinical uh, scenario is severe toxic shock syndrome. So what are some of the organisms that give you tox, the, what are the main major organisms that give you toxic shock syndrome? Anybody? I'm 
Thank you. Thank you. Strep, Clostridium, anaerobic infection. Thank you, Suhel. Yes, right. Your staph, strep, anaerobes, Clostridium. And also, actually, uh, uh, Pseudomonas uh, does produce uh, some, some toxin as well, but not into that clinical uh, syndrome of toxic shock syndrome, right? So, Staph aureus, probably not your usual uh, vaginal flora, right? So does uh, is Pseudomonas. Uh, strep pyogenes is group A strep, right? Again, remember, gr uh, group A strep is, has been more implicated with um, colonization of uh, healthcare workers. Then it comes down to these two uh, Clostridium species, and the correct answer is yes. Thank you, Clostridium sordellii. Uh, remember, um, Clostridium sordellii in these patients with these risk factors, specifically episiotomies, uh, retained vaginal packs, uh, somebody who's had uh, a very bad uh, abortion uh, at an abortion clinic, and and other retained uh, materials in their uterus and the cervix. Uh, Clostridium bifermentans is another kind of trivia um, that's, that has been in, uh, associated with super infection, so, that, so with uh, sordellia, associated with tungiasis forming biofilm within the epidermis. Does anybody know what tungiasis is? Tung, tungiasis? Anybody? I've had a patient at TGH with um, delusional parasitosis that, that he thought he had tungiasis. Anybody? <laughs> it's basically a... Oh. Please speak up. Uh, is it some sort of like parasitic infection? No. Uh in African countries, but I'm forgetting which exact parasite it is. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Basically, a, a fly um, fly bites you. Uh, again, yeah, African countries. Thank you, Swell. And they they lay basically their larvae on your skin, and then it comes out as a, a parasitic infection. So <laughs> thank you, Swell. So completely unrelated. But, you know, uh, trivia question. All righty. Post Abortal infections, again, infect ascending process has something to do with your retained products of conception or operative trauma, uh, risk factors, including greater duration of pregnancy, a lot of technical difficulties if they had to use many different instruments to get the baby out, um, and any unsuspected presence of uh, sexually transmitted pathogens or, or again, bacterial vaginosis comes up again. So onset is with usually within four days after procedures. And again, these patients would present similarly with fevers, chills, abdominal pain, uh, foul smelling vaginal discharge and, and a lot of passage of placental tissue. Uh, physical exam, kind of similar findings again with the fevers, tachycardia. And, and very important to do a pelvic exam in these patients because you would if you if you're finding a lot of um, pus drainage out and, and uterine tenderness um, in, in the uh, annexal and parametrial area, maybe you, we need to do further imaging for these patients. So which one was it again? Was the rapidly fatal disease caused by this particular organism that results to DIC, massive intravascular hemolysis, jaundice, because they're hemolyzing, uh, mahogany colored urine, tea colored urine, and catastrophic anemia. Very rapidly fatal. And we're sort of describing uh, uh, also a very shocky patient, right? And and rapidly. So we, if we, if we don't um, recognize this uh, clinical syndrome, these these patients can uh, uh, die very quickly. And if we don't um, initiate all the tr uh, treatments, seven results. Can I see two more results before we move on? Oh, there's a timer. Oh. Okay. 
Okay, I'll be happy with eight. So, right, it was your, yes, Clostridium perfringens. Yes, good thought on the mixed aerobic and anaerobic infection too, um, but this particular picture that was being painted was uh, Clostridium perfringens. You would expect, um, again, for, but more generally, your, you think about mixed aerobic and anaerobic infection in somebody, not necessarily a pregnant patient, but somebody coming in with this type of picture who had a trauma. Correct answer is Clostridium perfringens. Excellent, you guys. Okay. Uh, diagnosis: um, You can culture the endometrial cavity with an endometrial suction curette. I've not really seen one done yet <laughs> because you know there would be contamination if you just kind of directly uh, insert a, a Q-tip. Uh, blood cultures, CAT scans, and upright chest X-ray. You're looking for kind of any for any sort of foreign bodies or intrauterine gas. So for uh, simple infections, uh, you can do a combination of either give them one time a parenteral drug and then if they're feeling well enough, they can go home on an oral regimen and more established deeper infection, patients not looking well, they need to be hospitalized for a parenteral antibiotic and uh, prompt uterine evacuation and always, always, right, always remove the infected tissue, drain the abscess, remove any leftover uh, uh, placental tissue from these women. Uh, some of the regimens that they talk about um, is, again, for simple, again, because it's, it's potentially like one dose and then you, uh, you discharge them, uh, one dose uh, intramuscular ceftriaxone or cefox uh, cef uh, cefoxetine or any of your other um, third generation cephalosporin plus an oral regimen for 14 days with or without uh, addition of flagell. And more aggressive uh, Parenteral therapy, IV regimens for uh, localized infection, minima, minimal systemic findings. Again, our, our good old uh, 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 second and third gen generation cephalosporins, your ampicil, uh, unison or uh, piptazo for more extensive uh, with moderate to severe findings. Again, we see back our, our aggressive regimen with the clindamycin, gentamicin, and ampicillin. And with the addition of your carbapenem, especially if you know the patient's already colonized with an ESBL organism. So what would be the indication for the patients to go undergo laparotomy or we uh, um, kind of just have a discussion with our OB colleagues, right? So if, they're, if they fail to respond to, a, to uterine evacuation, on appropriate medical therapy, they're just not improving, they're suspected bowel perforation, um, abscess, any type of abscess that needs drainage, and again, gas gangrene or um, necrotizing myonecrosis, which we, we absolutely cannot miss um, uh, clinically. Okay, so that was the main bulk of our of our discussion, and now we have some, we say some stragglers <laughs> with UTIs, GBS, and HSV. All right, not a few, just few, a few slides left, guys. All right, we should notice that this is uh, this comes up pretty frequently, right? Is pregnancy an indication to screen and treat for asymptomatic bacteria? And this can be worded many different ways. But asymptomatic bacteria. There's really only two indication to screen uh, per the per the IDC guideline. If you you want to screen and treat for asymptomatic bacteria. So is pregnancy one of them is the question. All right, and the answer is true. Yay, love to see this. Okay, what is the other indication to treat, to screen and treat for asymptomatic bacteria, bacteriuria? Um, hi, Dr. Katzman. I think it's uh, if someone, if a patient is going like an invasive urologic procedure. Yes, thank you. And w was that Anna? Yes. Yes, I, thank you, Anna. Yes, invasive urologic procedure that involves mucosal bleeding. Right, so those are the only two hard indications where you would actually treat for asymptomatic bacteria. Thank you. Okay, the correct answer is true. Um, typically, all pregnant patients are screened at about 12 to 16 weeks of, excuse me, gestation, and 
and looking for that greater than 10, 10 to the fifth uh, colony forming unit of, of any type of bacteria that needs to be uh, gets treated. So antibiotics used uh, for simple UTI, simple cystitis in pregnant ladies is everything that you see here. Um, uh, uh, first line drugs, right? But you want to avoid your macrobid, your nitrofurantoin and Bactrim, uh, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazil in, their in the first trimester and at term. And which two antibiotics here listed does not achieve therapeutic levels in kidney where so you you probably shouldn't use them in 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 patients where you're suspecting a little bit of ascending infection or or even pyelonephritis even even as a step down which two drugs here does not achieve therapeutic levels in kidney anybody hi uh, i think it would be nitro furantoin and phosphomycin Thank you, Tom. Excellent. Yeah, nitrofurantoin and phosphomycin do not achieve therapeutic levels in kidney. And so if, if we think backwards then too, so they're not really systemic, uh, systemically absorbed, right? So it's it's really good to use uh, nitrofurantoin and phosphomycin uh, to also, they have lesser risk for uh, uh, C. diff infection. Thank you, Tom. All right, group B strep. We've sort of touched uh, based uh, with group B strep. Um, in the previous slides, they are in, they are because they are a colonizer in in more than I, th I believe 50 percent of women uh, in in their pregnancy. Group B strep is strep agalactiae. Uh, again, we've seen that they are a risk factor for developing intramniotic infections, postpartum infections, and stillbirths as well. At the same time, they can cause ASV, asymptomatic bacteria, uh, cystitis, and pyelonephritis. So tr treatment of choice is right. Good old penicillin for any strep, strep penicillin, strep penicillin, penicillin, amoxicillin, cephalexine for five to seven days. Um, ampicillin can also be used, um, but uh, less so favorable. Also, those penicillin because of the very frequent dosing. Like really for outpatient uh, treatment, when you guys are uh, prescribing outpatient antibiotics, best to do maximum th three times a day or you know every eight, eight hour uh, regimen than, than Q6. It's almost impossible to do Q6 uh, <laughs> dosing. Um, and it is an indication for intrapartum chemoprophylaxis at the time of delivery. So uh, pregnant patients get screened about um, near uh, in their third trimester for group B strep. Uh, and if they're positive, they just get get a dose of either like ampicillin or, or penicillin at the time of delivery. All right. I oh, had a few questions left, sorry. Repeat urine culture is necessary to document clearance of group B strep in treated pa pregnant patients. So if you've already done, let's say, the urine culture initially, and then the patient, uh, patient got treated for, let's say, asymptomatic bacteriuria, or, 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 you know, if they actually presented with cystitis, do we, do we repeat urine cultures in these patients? It's, it's the question, right? Generally, we never, uh, repeat urine culture to, to, to document clearance, but is this indicated for pregnant patients? Okay. Yes, you can still change your answers. <laughs> okay. All right, the correct answer is, yay, true, that's right. So um, with even, I think, not not even um, necessarily group B strep, but I've noticed some some OB practitioners just you know make sure that once the asymptomatic, regardless of the bacteria, if the once once the asymptomatic bacteria is treated, they always get a repeat urine culture to document um, clearance in these in these pregnant patients. Okay, so the answer is true. Excellent. All right, moving on to HSV herpes. Um, uh, herpes uh, virus. Clinical findings is similar in pregnant versus non-pregnant patients where you would find these, you know, nice looking uh, vesicles in that erythematous face. In women without um, history of active genital ulcer in the past, they recommend checking for both uh, direct viral tests, which is, you know, a, a PCR swab of the, the ulcer and a serologic status. 
because in, in these patients, the highest risk is with newly acquired uh, infection, let's say a primary or non-primary first episode compared to a reactivation, reactivation disease. And, uh, and the transmission of, of obviously occurs uh, for, to the infant during labor uh, via direct contact. And, and checking for both PCR and serologic status does affect management because for, for generally new genital ulcers in, in uh, new, again, in patients who has who have not had HSV or, or genital ulcer in the past, uh, you go ahead and treat them with acyclovir or val acyclovir, e uh, easier dosing than acyclovir. Uh, which would lessen the duration or of the lesions and viral shedding and decrease complication in the infant. But for recurrent episodes, so somebody who's already had genital ulcer before and known HSV before, they already have um, uh, uh, IgG in their in their serologic tests as well. Usually, they say it is short lived and no intervention is required. It's at least what 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 the uh, recommendation is. <laughs> I don't know if we we would actually not treat them. Um, clinically uh, and, and in real practice. So if they have lesions at the time of delivery, uh, daily, uh, daily or near the time of delivery, uh, daily suppressive regimen can be considered until, until labor and then they get a C-section. And that, everybody, is my last slide. Any questions?